Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Peccadillo Sofa Club. Tonight we are celebrating the film The Act, which is part of the Boys on Film uh, distribution network. And to join us tonight, we've got the director and co-writer of the film, Thomas Hescott. We've got Simon Lennon and we've got Samuel Barnett, who both play the leads. So let's say hi to them. Good evening, guys. Hi, Chris. Hi. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Thanks for having Ooh. us. Yes, it's a pleasure. <laughs> right, let's take a little look at the uh, trailer so everybody can see what we're talking about. I now turn to the arguments commonly advanced against reform. If we relax the law in any way, homosexuality will spread like a prairie fire. We allow ourselves to have friends and sex with strangers that doesn't mean anything and I am tired of feeling like that is what life is. Because people like you and me... I ain't like you. I want more. I look at you and I want more. Take the weight off your stillies, Mr. Matthews. <laughs> we are all family here. As you can see, it's a fantastic creation. Um, it's a really moving film, really complex characters, uh, really high production levels. I mean, it looks fantastic and obviously a brilliant cast. So I thought we'd uh, discuss some of the themes of the film tonight. So the first one that I thought was very interesting, well, to set the scene, the film's set in the mid 60s. Parliament is just debating uh, the um, overhaul of the hom Homosexual Criminal Act. It's getting to the point where homosexuality for men is going to be legalised. Uh, so that's kind of the framing of the film. Um, it's interesting, the film, because obviously for, for a lot of gay men, their culture at this time was um, shaped by the legislation and by the restrictions of the, of the society. Um, Thomas, when you when you came to make this film, how how did you feel about showing going beyond the stereotypes of the nineteen sixties for gay men? I, yeah, thank you. That that really was, I think, partly the starting point. Um, the 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 story was in my mind for I think now for about twenty years. Um, it grew out of. I was walking past Gays the Wood Bookshop in London, which I'm sure pretty much everyone here will know, but it's probably one of the most important bookshops um, around. Uh, and uh, I picked up a book of interviews with men uh, who were sort of alive and uh, in, in between the two acts of parliament making um, acts of male homosexuality illegal. And that kind of just stayed with me. And I knew I wanted to do something with that story or, or with those stories uh not necessarily the the stories in there the, the the interviews sort of none of this is directly from the interviews they kind of gave us texture but just about those lives and um and that stayed with me and i never knew quite what to do with it, it just stayed with me for about another 10 years and the oval house theater were looking to commission a series of pieces about um counterculture to celebrate their 50th anniversary and so the, the starting question when we when we created the the monologue that the film's based on was what if you are thrust into a counterculture not through choice but through necessity and so and so that 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 sort of sense of a of a world that shaped the, the, the clubs that you choose to go to the bars that you choose to go to aren't necessarily a choice but they're where you have to go to um, and in, within there you've got three very different relationships to that world. You've got Edna May who embraces it and who we always sort of feel, we never explicitly say it, but we're, we always sort of feel is probably quite anti-decriminalization because it would destroy the very counterculture that they belong to. Um, and you've got, uh, you, you've got um, Matthews who sort of has a romanticized, quite heteronormative view of what he wants 
um, from life. Uh, and Jimmy, who would absolutely not um, uh, recognize himself as, as a gay or even a bisexual man. Uh, and has also found a way of monetizing uh, that world. And I, I'm pretty sure will go on to buy up Soho uh, and to be kind of the, the uh, you know, one of the sort of uh, founders of that kind of pink pound monetization. You know, he probably owns the equivalent of GOY at this point in time. <laughs> but yes, he started, he started by renting himself. And then when it became legit, sort of, you know, rents out the property. That's what, that's what I think he does anyway. <laughs> but um, mm-hmm. you've got three very different responses to that, that sense of a counterculture. Yeah, and it real it really feels like you uh you've done a really deft job of showing a real broad range of the culture very quickly in the film, because I think um, with hindsight towards different historical eras, it's easy to presume that the provide, presiding legislation of the society dominates the culture or dictates the culture, and that sets that sets in motion um, a kind of monoculture, just following the legislation. But when I've talked to older, older gay men, the, the, the different ways that people found to express the culture, to meet people, to find friends and support, they were so varied. And I think the film does a great job of that. And, and I don't think that the, 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 the partial decriminalization, I don't think it changed much initially. What, what I mean, I think arrests went up and blackmail went up. And because of, particularly because of the 21, someone who was 22 dating their 18 year old in 1970 was probably more likely to be thrown in prison at that point. So, so what was interesting is, it, although this is about that lead up to, uh, to, the, to the partial decriminalization, I, 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 I don't think it's this huge turning point. I think, as you say, you know, what. The, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a disconnect between the laws that are made and how people live their lives, I think. Yeah, it struck me that that's similar to the way that um, certain people um, in Europe, perhaps, talk about gay cultures or gay scenes in countries around the globe that have still have very um, draconian legislation towards gay people. And there, there can often be a presumption that there's no gay scene in those worlds or that gay people are just literally locked in the closet. But even in those societies, like a very vibrant and surprisingly open uh, gay cultures can exist and, and rub along in the society in a remarkable way, really. Okay, okay so yeah. let's, let's look at the way um, Sam and Simon's characters meet. Uh, we've got a little clip here, so let's take a look. Well, I think that was I think that was more than just meeting. Um, <laughs> my mum might be watching this, and um, <laughs> she hasn't seen the, the film yet. <laughs> was yeah. Stella work, really it's stellar. Stella bed work. Yes, yeah, stellar bed work. <laughs> uh, so, guys, obviously, a cottage in uh, the narrative of a nineteen sixties set drama. That's that's quite um, well trodden territory, shall we say? But obviously. 
the interesting thing about this film is that the the relationship that comes out of that meeting is very different from the stereotype of meeting someone in a cottage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, yes, of course, the stereotype is that you meet, you have sex, probably in the location, nowhere else, and that's <laughs> it, you leave. And um, And I think it's all about access. And I think in some ways, even in this country, as liberal as we are now, the laws that we have to sort of protect us most of the time, I think it still hasn't changed in many ways, and especially in places where it's not legal or there are really draconian laws around it, or they're still criminalizing it despite sort of decriminalizing it, that it is about access. How else do you meet someone? How else do you know? What's the code, you know? Um, and so, of course, it's not the stereotype isn't true, I, or maybe it's partly true. But of course, there's a much wider range of what what happens afterwards. And for these two characters, they I think they I think it's fair to say, certainly for Matthews, he just completely falls in love. Why why this particular person? I don't know. But then that's you know why does anyone fall in love with anyone? But I I think he's. I don't know. I don't know if we ever discussed if this is like properly his first time that he's done this. But he does just fall completely in love with Jimmy. And I think that is, I think, the modern equivalent of cottaging, apart from where it still absolutely happens these days, because of course it does, are, are the apps where people meet in those rooms. And then it used to be such a... I remember the first time I sort of heard somebody going, you know, how did you two meet? And them going, oh, we, we met on Grindr. Like it was a like it was a bad thing because mm. Grindr was the equivalent of you hook up, you have sex, that's it, the end. Mm. And now I know so many relationships that have sprung out of that where it's become, even internet dating before apps was like that. Internet dating was sort of more hooking up and, and there was an embarrassment around acknowledging that that's where you met. But I think now it's become much more normalized and acceptable, but I think the root of it is still the same, that it is about access and about access to, to your people. Yeah, there seems to be a great um, uh, undiminished hopeful energy that comes out of situations like that, where the circumstances of the culture cause, cause people to have to behave in certain ways, go to certain lengths to meet or to connect. But then out of that, it's a bit like Jean Genet, flowers blooming in prisons. You know, mm. it's that kind of image for me that, that um, wonderful, hopeful things can happen. Uh, this is my dog, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful, hopeful things can happen out of the uh, most unexpected situations. Because uh, I've always wondered how many um, older gay couples I knew actually met in a toilet in Islington. Mm -hmm and didn't meet at a friend's dinner party. You know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't say it, but, um, you know, beautiful things can occur. Uh, so I, I just I remember in the research, so I, cause I just remembered in, there was a version of this where they pass notes backwards and forwards under the cubicle doors. And that came from the research. And I, I it was so extraordinary cause I, because I, my, my sort of understanding of cottages was that, you know, anonymous hookups in that location. And what was amazing about the notes, that I seem to remember that's why they ended up back in the flat was because these notes went, oh, you know, meet me at such and such a place. And uh, yeah, so yeah, which, which yeah, I think it, it threw me and surprised me and was kind of one of the nice surprising things in that in those interviews was that idea of actually it not it, it being a place to meet, not simply a place to um uh not not just the place to sort of to have sex yeah because i remember uh, personally one of the greatest little romances i ever had was with someone i met in a sauna and we mm. had a lovely time like after about five minutes i said Should we go to my house and then we just a whole different world opened up but that's my history anyway <laughs> <laughs> um so um the two characters simon uh your character jimmy um runs in quite a contrast to sam's character you there seems to be a contrast between the two characters between the act of 
homosexual acts and being being a homosexual, being gay. And obviously that's built into the discussion of the film and the title. So Simon, your character seems to be very much Focus solely on the act and and none of the identity around it. Yeah, I think so. And I think talking about the sort of frequenting of, of the toilets and stuff like that, it's like, I feel like it's something that Jimmy did very often and it was a very sort of practical thing for him and as, and as Tom touched on, monetizing it and it being almost a sort of profession within itself as well. And I think what's beautiful about how the, the film's told and the sort of story explores is is Jimmy breaking away from that world slightly and start starting to see himself um as an individual and, and, and sort of acknowledging his emotions and, and 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 the stuff within him which he's sort of refusing to let anyone see or even for himself to feel. And I think th that's the thing he's ultimately grappling with is, is his thoughts and feelings and attitudes towards his life and his sexuality. And and I think there's a part of seeing Matthews and hearing him speak openly about his life and his thoughts and his feelings that that Jimmy can't, still can't quite access, and that that I think creates confrontation and aggression from within him to try yeah. and sort of allow himself to acknowledge that stuff. Yeah, because obviously there's it seems that the attraction of the characters is is built upon that opposite of energy. Um, and one of the things that struck me about the film is obviously today there's the the well-used phrase that if you can't see it, you can't be it. But for men in this time, they they often just could not see gay men in the world. Uh, they could see gay acts, obviously, by going to certain space, but the idea of an identity of being gay, of a cultural identity of being gay, that didn't exist. And so, Sam, for your character, it seems like the there's an internal introspection, which is his strength and his kind of touchstone of how he chooses to navigate and engage in the world. Yeah. I, I, I we, we sort of talk about it in terms of back then, you know, if you, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And back then, you know, there, there were no examples in media and, uh, and all that in culture really of, of, gay people just living their lives and having relationships and but you know in you asking that question growing up where I grew up in the 80s there was also no representation not in the media there was certainly no positive representation I should say there was only negative representation and that thing if you've got to to see it to be it 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 it's I get it in terms of, um, again, in terms of kind of um, diversity, and I mean that in every sense, in terms of representation within our industry and within society. But but it comes from somewhere deeper because if you can't see it, it comes from within. And I I couldn't see it, but I I knew growing up that there was no way I could deny my identity and there's no value judgment on this at all mm. so that was just incredibly strong for me from the beginning for some people there are more layers of denial which probably helped them survive but yeah. for me it was very much like it had to come from within but it was a very sort of i found filming this film and playing the character incredibly sad it really tapped into a very old part of me that re very much remembers feeling alone and on my own and that I had to that that if I would if I wanted to be it it was going to have to come from me because it couldn't come from anywhere else so yeah. I think that's captured brilliantly in the film but I also think it's just it's still very much now never mind the 80s there are people out there who still are finding that and what I find interesting in 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 the contrast actually between the characters is is that thing um I hope this is accurate to say but <coughs> I knew growing up that I just I just couldn't help it. I, I couldn't hide. I just could not help it. And um and I feel like that's that is slightly Matthews. He he goes under the radar, he has to, as I did. But then I feel like with, with Jimmy, oh he is the other end of a sort of spectrum where it's like a sort of disassociation from that. 
and and able to kind of cover that up and deny it and sure there are needs and there are wants so you do the act but actually you don't connect with anything else like simon was saying that kind of you you don't connect with the emotionality of it or what you might really need as a, as an as a person as a human being i just think um that's drawn brilliantly between those two characters but i <laughs> i see it happen today mm. all the time still yeah i think i i understand your point completely about the the importance of the representation i i think in this film particularly it's especially heroic how how matthew seems to have that energy that ability to reach inside himself and find that strength mm. um we've got a little clip which i think uh which i think demonstrates some of that that energy that that drives matthew's character let's take a look it's a simple question sir you were keen to see mr moran I told you last week, he was someone I believed I could help. How is it proof of criminal actions on my part? Do you think this is a normal way? Am I being questioned about what I do or... or what I am? Your job is to decide whether or not I have committed acts of indecency and should be removed from society. I'm aware of what my Am I an invert? Yes, I am. I am not the only invert in this country. We are your, your child's teacher, your doctor, your bachelor uncle. We're invisible unless we find the courage to speak out. And in that act, not the act which you accuse me of, but the simple act of speaking out. In this act, we change the world. It's great, that scene. It really kind of... Um... Obviously, I think you get a sense that the character knows that you're on the cusp of something really changing, and it and it it allies with his internal motivation to kind of to to take that step into the public. It's quite fascinating. Yeah, he he just can't compromise anymore. I, I it's mm. it's that moment of going. I would rather lose my freedom than myself, mm. which is it, what happens to him. It was written in anger. Uh, it was uh, it was about ten years ago when we were first when we first wrote it, and <clears throat> at the time I think there was a lot of my friends and colleagues and who that it sort of it became uncool to come out. It was a sort of sense of a personal choice, personal freedom, which is fine, but also that we were beyond labels. We were beyond saying you're saying I you know I am a gay man or you know or anything like that. That, that it sort of uh that that was all a bit passe and and part of me felt yeah it's great let's have a utopia where we don't have to come out but i also felt that we weren't there yet and for everyone not uh I didn't, without wanting to judge any of my colleagues but for any actor who who decided that they didn't they weren't going to come out for anyone who wasn't going to say that that was one less public role model and i i've just been really fascinated by that uh, that uh, the difference between the sort of Harvey Milk, uh, you have a responsibility and we will forcibly out you if you don't out yourself, and the more contemporary uh, sense of it being a personal choice and personal freedom, and to, and that's where that journey goes. And that and, and it it whilst it being something about the 1960s was also something about all of my friends in 2012 when we first wrote it. Yeah, so there's a there's a kind of strong sense in that responsibility of needing to lift something up in society, recognize its existence, and only then can it start to settle back into the wider kind of um, understanding of the society that we actually live in, rather than the society that people might like us to live in. Exactly. Um, Great. OK, so let's take a little commercial break now. For you guys at home, we're going to show you the trailer, which is for the, um, the edition of The Boys on Film that this short film is part of. 
Um, Peccadillo Pictures have put together numerous of these. There's ones also called Here Come the Girls. Um, and they all favor um, uh, filmmakers, new actors, new writers, people who want to test their limits, try something different. And it's a great way to um, open up everybody's exposure to new film. So let's take a look. Two, three, four. I look at you and I want more. Can I take for breakfast? We are all family here. We'll find the freedom that we so desperately need. It is the ultimate connection. been in New York for three years now. I guess my relationship with sex hasn't always been healthy. You got a girlfriend? He still won't kiss me in public. No one's watching. But he's great. Sam! What are you doing here? Listen, I don't know why I can't bring my boyfriend flowers. This is moving really fast. <clears throat> Seeing doctors, you mean? We did all the tests, nothing came up. You're good. Am I the first black guy you ever dated? What is that supposed to mean? Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're here tonight. We've, we're looking at the short film, The Act. Uh, we've got Thomas, Sam, and Simon, the director, and the two actors from the film joining us tonight to discuss it. So, guys, the next uh, piece I wanted to discuss was about the character's vulnerability. Obviously, there's numerous pressures on each of the characters, um, both internally and externally, um, in this period in time and in the period in their lives. And it seems interesting as their, as their relationship develops and we see it become more intertwined, their reaction to each other as they become vulnerable to one another seems to go in two ways. Sam, your character seems to go towards, um, uh, leaning towards the character's achievement and sense of power and ability to move and to, um, to negotiate his way through the world. And Simon, your character seems to be more about a, um, a, a, a sense of denying connection and being, being able to stand on your own two feet and stand away from people and, and not fall prey to, to the kind of that softness of connection. Yeah, I, I think the heartbreaking thing in the playing of it and in, and in the writing and in the performances and stuff is, is, is Jimmy's denial to al allow himself the the sort of beauty of that relationship. And the, there's, there's so many sort of like little complexities within it as well about like money and about class and stuff like that. And there's there's a moment where Matthews corrects him on his terminology and stuff like that and, and, and his grammar. And it's little things like that where it's like they're very different people generally on the surface. And then also in terms of the, the sort of acceptance and exploration of the sexuality, also at very opposite ends of the spectrum. And I think as the film progresses, the the fascinating thing to, to see is, is the sort of moving together of the two of them, of accepting each other's differences and, and similarities and sort of finding common ground. But, but within that, there's still the like the refusal on Jimmy's part to, to ever to ever kiss Matthews, despite the fact that they're having sex regularly, that he still won't allow himself the the sort of closeness and intimacy of 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 a sort of blossoming relationship. Yeah, and there's that line where you said, "I'm not, I'm, I'm not like you." Not like you, yeah. That there there seems to be there seems to be a safety in isolating the act as just a thing you do during a moment in time on the weekend or whatever, yeah. but it doesn't spread to the rest of your identity. Yeah. And I, th I think like, especially with, with, with Jimmy in terms of, we spoke a lot uh, at the very beginning of the process about like his work and like, like if he's like working on building sites and stuff like that, if he's a laborer and, and, and if he's a, within a potentially very toxic um, masculine environment, especially at that time, the the worry of 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 being vulnerable or, or or allowing other people to know 
who he was and how he felt about other people, I think terrified him. And, and, and that's exacerbated in those altercations with Matthews when, when he's sort of prodded about money and about, about other things in his life that, that, that he obviously grapples with quite strongly to then sort of vehemently deny anything that, that, that he can easily try and sort of put a block up about. And I think it's within those moments with Matthews where you you can see that there's something between them and that the, there's a beauty there and that there's there's something so close and so so gorgeous about it. But the, the, the denial of that opportunity, I think, is the ultimately heartbreaking thing. Mm, we've got a clip that illustrates a lot of what you've been talking about. So let's take a look at that. Do you not have five pounds? I've just got two bushes. This is just a joke to you, isn't it? I need my rent and... And what? Quiet is it tonight, down the dilly. I ain't worked this week. The laying men off and... I, I thought... I was hoping... If I got a place... You could live with me. I ain't your little project. Y you can keep a room for yourself. And at night, when the rest of the world is asleep, you can creep up and lie next to you me. You really don't get it, do you? I like you. A lot. We allow ourselves to have friends and, and sex with strangers that doesn't mean anything, and I am tired of feeling like that is what life is. Because people like you and me... I ain't like you. I want more. I look at you... And I want more. Sam, that section uh, for for Matthews, it seems to bring out a lot of. I don't know if you've read the Velvet Rage, the like, kind of classic book by Alan Downs. In that book, he talks about how a a response to shame can be to overachieve, to garner power and success and privilege and position. And it seems that there's there's something in Matthews where where that that kind of power power imbalance really feeds into the complications of what they're trying to negotiate here. Yeah, I mean, th there's 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 a sort of moment in in watching it, and I didn't necessarily pick this up at the time when you were just playing the scene, but I thought watching it back. There, there's a there is a real class thing that goes on here, and there is a real snobbishness to Matthews in in that moment in that scene. He, he's so dismissive of who Jimmy is and what Jimmy does and how Jimmy lives, and it's it's um. I think he's so. Tom said it earlier. I think about it, it's a very sort of heteronormative view, but I think they're both such products of the time and the society and how they grew up, they've just gone different ways with it. Mm. Um, and I think there's also some sort of savior complex in there, but actually I think the reason they, I think the fundamental reason they fall for each other. And I think why a lot of couples fall for each other or people want each other. They see something in one another that they lack in themselves, even if that's unconscious, they don't know they lack it, but they just see something they want. And I think for both of them, for Matthews and Jimmy, he sees something weirdly much freer than he is, much less guarded, especially sexually. And I think in Matthews, Jimmy probably sees the acceptance, the inner acceptance of the identity of being a gay person. And they want that, but what they just come up against is all of their conditioning. It's the it's the beginning of a brilliant, beautiful romance, and then, actually, in any coupledom, you come up against yourself. Yeah, and, and you can either get through that together or you can't. But they neither of them have actually got themselves sorted out. So all of their own beliefs about God, Jimmy's about Matthews, and Matthews about Jimmy. Those beliefs just just bash like that, and um, they just needed a bit of couples therapy. <laughs> they just need to sit down and have a <laughs> yeah it seems that they're moving from very quickly from a position of objectifying each other into seeing each other then as actual complex flawed human beings and that's obviously i think that's a very um that's that's the process we all go through as you say in all relationships um 
I thought one of the um, also strong elements of the film is, or that the, the film brings up in a wider sense, culturally, is just how remarkable the speed of change has been in this country and in, in many countries around the world in the last hundred years. Um, but obviously within that, there's a, there's a warning sign of if something can go in one direction this fast, then there's a warning that it could also go the opposite direction just as fast. And uh, um, we seem obviously with the, with the political upheaval of the last kind of 10 years across the globe with right-wing parties coming, um, coming back to prominence and power in different countries, it seems that we're in a, another precarious time. I think I'm old enough now to have lived through various precarious times. Uh, but this seems precarious. And I wonder how you guys feel about that, where the film sits in the current state um, of the culture. I think, I think it's, sorry, go on. All right, well, I was, I was just gonna say, I think you can take a lot of those parliamentary debates and take out the word invert and put in the word trans. Uh, I think this is, I think a lot of what you, a lot of the political discourse um, uh, was uh, around the decriminalization was patronizing. It was based on uh, taking pity uh, mm. on the queer community. It was, uh, it wasn't about accepting it, but about tolerating it. Uh, and I think you can uh, you see that same discourse now uh, for other communities um, that, that, that we uh, we reach these changes not not because anyone wants to but because they have to because politicians are ultimately forced into it and 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 tiny you know what the, the it's extraordinary from the census how such a small uh, minority can take up so much uh, um, in in terms of the opposition to that minority. Yes, yeah, so, so for me, I, I just I, I look at these co these conversations and and just see all these debates and just you you see exactly the same happening with other minorities right now. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I just I just think rights are being rolled back. Um, for the queer community all over the world, rights that have been fought for are now being rolled back. They might not be being rolled back in this country for gay people, but certainly trans people are just under attack. And um, this, this film, therefore, is more relevant than ever, I think. Yeah, and it seems that the more, the further we go to a globalized understanding of, of human culture, we're butting up against um, uh, cultures that have very draconian rules. And, and oftentimes our first relationship with these cultures is financial or commercial or in trade, which then enters. I was invited to do a talk at the MOD once about being out and being gay. And um, I sat with a person who was from one of those kind of big Price Waterhouse Cooper kind of com companies. And I said to him, you know, when you send your gay staff to countries where it's illegal, what do you do to support them? What do you say? And the answer basically was, well, you know, just keep quiet. And I thought, well, that's not good enough. You know, that's which, not good enough. Which is exactly what football supporters were told to do when going to Qatar. Just yeah, keep quiet. Just put it, keep it in your pocket. Yeah. It's it's a it's a it's a very difficult situation. I think also some of the um, some of the uh, like I've always wondered why Stonewall hasn't gone global as a as a as a movement. You know, it's done stellar work in the Western world or with um, with gay rights here, but it feels to me like the obvious next step is to go international mm. and to to lobby to make gay rights a human right as as we as we over here believe you know and then extending out into the all the other movements as well um okay so just to finish this off for this section we're going to have a last look at the film uh this is a moment in the film where the police as we saw in the earlier clip the police have become involved uh 
Jimmy made a slight mistake in the toilet one evening. <laughs> and uh, the police have been involved. And as happens when the police are involved in this uh, day and age, you're asked to tell people who you who you spend your time with, who you have relationships with. And that puts both of the characters in quite a difficult situation. We'll take a look. They're interviewing me again. I'll take the blame for leading you into it. If at the other end, will you wait for me? I told you. I ain't like you. I am quite aware of what you told me. Kiss me. So that kiss me line uh, then becomes a theme in the film. And it's interesting because this is the short film. Obviously, we won't give the ending away, but the ending seems to me to be the beginning of the story, really. It's, it's, um, it's, it's quite remarkable. And so, Thomas, is there, is there a sense of perhaps a sequel? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've talked about, uh, yeah, we, we've got something... I, I should say it took about 10 years to write the monologue and then it took about another 10 years to turn that monologue into a short film. So when I say this, <laughs> we've got about 10 years to wait. Mm -hmm. um, but we have been working on uh, a, a, a slightly bigger story. We were asked if we wanted to turn it into a feature. I mean, we were asked, no one gave us any money for it. We would have said yes if they'd given us money. Um, but we, we felt we'd sort of told this particular story. But um, we've been working on something which is uh, a bigger narrative um, that is uh, shows a bigger sense of the community, um, in, uh, including the lesbian community in there as well, and uh, is, is sort of uh, it, it, it shows that sort of um, uh, I'm trying to think what I can say and what I can't say. It, it, it basically shows that sort of um, movement towards the first pride, pride, and it's a kind of like a family saga where. The family is your chosen family rather than your biological family. That's with a production company and development. And if it ever, you know, we all know the things being with production companies and development is um, is what it is. But yeah, yeah. There's, there's, uh, it, they are. I, I realise that they're three characters that I seem to just go back and back and back to when I'm writing, which is either very profound or very unimaginative of me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll look forward to that. Um, obviously, I think I think that is a very interesting period of time. Um, that build up to the first Pride marches is is a fascinating period, and I've, a lot of older friends of mine have told me about some of the kind of early meetings they went to, where you know they just didn't know anybody there, and it and it became a real community and something quite, quite fascinating to hear about. Um, okay, so we're going to go to some audience questions now. Um, so hopefully my producer's going to pass me some. <laughs> hopefully. Uh, thank you, everybody, for posting your questions. If you have a question, then pop it in the uh, comments, and our producers will be plucking from there something interesting for us to ask. Um, okay, so first, as policies towards queer folk become more and more open and relaxed, do you think that will change what we know as gay culture? Yeah, I, God, that's a really profound question to start off with. <laughs> Going in with the hard ones first. I, I mean, I think co gay cultures are a continually shifting uh, sort of um, uh, sort of entity. I don't think I don't think it's a um, and, and I think it can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. I think what's really exciting is 
you know, sort of, um, what, what was the anniversary pride last year? Was it 50? I can't remember. But mm-hmm. we're now at a point when there is enough uh, time elapsed that there is such a thing as queer history. Um, and that really excites me. And, and it excites me, the, the hidden stories that are, that are, that are totally, you know, uh, you know, history being written by straight white men, uh, you know, th- that idea of the hidden history excites me. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think gay culture is constantly changing, but I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with the idea of the hidden gay history, which doesn't mm. answer the question at all. <laughs> I, think it does. I think I think obviously gay culture um, is is just ever growing in its complexity, isn't it? Different people requiring different things, going on different journeys, building different families. That seems to me a fascinating um, continual evolution that we're witnessing. Mm-hmm. Okay, one for you, Sam. Uh, someone's asked if there's going to be a Dirk Gently season three. <laughs> uh no um it's a shame we we were look if if you do the briefest bit of internet digging you will um find out why there isn't a Dirk Gently season three uh it was all ready to go um and it's a shame because actually Dirk's sort of um personal life was going to be explored and whether it's because it was me playing it. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but the uh, but the characters sort of um, the character was going to have a relationship, uh, which would have been funny on many levels because Dirk is such an odd person. Um, would have been great watching him try to have a relationship, but um, but it was certainly going to be a queer relationship. And I was I was I thought that was in terms of it being such sort of mainstream TV. I thought that was a really great um, moment of representation, but alas. No. So just just pretending that you were the casting director, who were you? Who would you have cast as? as, as he, he was. New. He was already. <laughs> Chris knew he was already <laughs> cast. He was already cast because he was a character from um, season two. Ah, yeah. Ah. So that'll leave him guessing. An Easter. Should, should we wrestle? Should we go into a big legal battle? Get the uh, get the rights, and then I can I can take over as showrunner. Yes, please. Let's do that. Yeah, do it. Um, uh, one question here is about the budget for the film. And Thomas, I think a lot of people um, engage with Peccadillo because they want to start making films or move into the film industry. Um, so obviously you've got a brilliant cast for this film. Can you give us some idea of how, how, do, you, how do you get it on? How do you get oh, it? Yeah, okay, I can. And this won't be helpful to anyone, but I also agree. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say that, that I had two aims with the film. One was to get it to BFI Flare, and one was to get it onto Boys on Film because my entire sort of framework for queer cinema comes from those two places, and they're really important to me. So I'm very happy we, we did those things. Um, getting short films off the ground is almost impossible. There's no money out there for them. Uh, BFI funds them. But you like it's, it's it's such a lottery to get that, and you've also got to have such a track record that you um, you know I could apply for BFI now with two shorts under my my belt. But how would I have made those two shorts in the first place? I'm going to be, uh, I mean, being around the industry for 20 years before you start making shorts really helps because you build up a, a you know a, a set of um, contacts and things like that. Funnily enough, casting is less to do with the money. You've got to have money to pay actors. But um, this cast, you know, I work that's, with Sam. That's not what they tell us, usually. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, uh, the trouble is I've written quite a lot of articles about how you have to pay people and now I can't get away with not because I've <laughs> um, But yeah, I mean, I, I worked with Sam at the National uh, 20 years ago um, and I directed uh, Simon in a play called Tory Boys slightly less than 20 years ago. So, you know, I've, I've been like finding actors isn't a, a thing for me. I, I've worked with a lot of them over the years. Um, the money was really, really lucky. Um, I said I wanted to turn this into a short. I said it's my co-writer, Matthew. Matthew is a trustee of a theatre uh, that had a number of patrons who were very excited about funding um, LGBTQ voices. And 
uh, so Matthew, and we knew that they, so we went, we, uh, Matthew went to them and Matthew said, how much do you need to make the film? And I said, 25,000 to ask for 50,000. Matthew went in and said, we needed 50,000 and they wrote a check. That never happens. That will never happen again. Uh, <laughs> totally, um, uh, totally unhelpful thing, way of telling people to make films because it just means, it, it, it just means go and ask rich people for money. I don't know any rich people, but luckily I, I have friends who do. Um, but yeah, I, it's so many films are made uh, by blagging them. My favourite short film is Valentine's Day by Kate Heron, and it's two minutes long. And I asked her, and she made it for two thousand pounds. And it was, and and it, for me, the perfect short film is to, like if you can make it, if you can tell a story in two minutes, then you're a genius. And Kate's a genius. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I don't think you need fifty thousand pounds to make a film. It was just really fun to have it. Um, and I, I recommend anyone go and look up films like Valentine's Day and see how you can make a film for two grand. And a lot of, uh, you know, and a lot, and and but you've got to have the people around you. You've got to know great DOPs, great editors great actors who, who want to kind of get involved. Uh, that Finding a really great script and finding a really great cast is more important than finding a money in many ways. The money will come later. Yeah. And um, for I've always found it interesting how, because um, obviously as an actor you get approached about kind of attaching yourself or being in the early stages of development for different projects. Um, I, it, it's so common for a project to be touted and then just them to try and raise a huge phenomenal amount of money and never get it. So the one advice I'd have to anybody watching is find a way, put, put a date in the diary and just say that you're going to shoot on that date. And then whatever money you've got, you just make it for that. Because I think I think getting the having a product there that you can show people moves you further than waiting another year to maybe get another 25 grand or something. It's, it's tricky and um, it's frightening. But uh, I think with films, films like this, the films on uh, short films that you can see on Boys on Films and at the film festivals, I think it's obvious the, um, what, what great stuff can come out of these endeavors. Okay, let's go for another question. Um, Someone's asked where you can see the, see this film if you haven't seen it already. And there's the Peccadillo Pod, which is the online um, player. You can watch it there. Okay. And then um, a question uh, for an imagined question for the future. If this were a feature length film, uh, what would be the scenes or the characters you would like to develop further and this person also compliments you guys on your colour coordination this evening. <laughs> this is the first thing I said when we joined the call. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> one lovely grey. Oh sorry, Sam's wearing sage green, not grey. Thank you. Thank Very you. Sage. <laughs> uh, Simon, what what would you if you if you got the feature film script through, what would you want to see in it? Oh that's such a good question. I think I think there's there's something there's something about exploring a little bit of the backstories of the characters of, 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 of their, their day-to-day life and how they they got to where they are and what it looks like outside of the sort of meetings that they have. Um, but I also think that's the beauty of the film is that you see them in these sort of intimate moments where it's just the two of them. And you and, and you expect in that moment that, that they'll just get on really well and have the most wonderful time and, and, they, and they still don't. And I think that's the fa- fantastic thing about the film is... It is that complexity and, and that sort of struggle within their relationship. Um, and I think in terms of like talking about the budget and stuff like that and about um, being fortunate enough to have had that budget to make this film, like that money definitely didn't go to waste either. It is shot beautifully. I, I think about the, the cinematography and the way Tom and Chris and everyone involved in creating the sort of imagery of it, how hard everyone worked because it is a beautifully made film. And Sam is fantastic. I, I watched it again today. I've watched it so many times, and it's not because I'm in it and I like watching myself perform. I genuinely think it's an it's a beautiful piece of cinema. Uh, the writing is exquisite. The performances are great, uh, and it just looks amazing. And I think films that I fall in love with are films that I I can watch and just go and and just feel so invested in the world that's been created by the 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 sort of cinematography and the landscapes and the people that sort of populate it. And I think, it, yeah, if it was to be made into a feature film, I'd just love to see 
more of that of of, of the imagery of that world of, of, of who they are and where they've come from and where they're going and and and, and their lives outside the sort of intimacy that they have with one another great yeah and for anybody who is interested at home there is a, on thomas's website there's a link to a short documentary about the way that you and the cinematographer made the look of the film which is quite interesting to watch especially if you're into cameras and lenses it's especially mm. interesting there <laughs> okay okay um that's it for this week Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for being with us and for sharing your your thoughts, your wisdom, your enjoyment, mm -hmm. your skill. Um, thank you to the BFI for continuing to support the Sofa Club. Next week, we've got the documentary Rebel Dykes, and that is going to be hosted by uh, the journalist and author Daisy Jones. But for now, we'll leave you with a trailer for that film, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. It was a great time and a terrible time to be young and queer. Thatcher had just got in. Politically, there was always this attempt to silence. We were very naughty.